one. Rachel Beckett, you are the chairperson of Wellburn Care and the creator of the We Care Badge. Welcome back to the Care Home Show. Thank you for having me back. It's, uh, it's lovely to have you. Um, I think starting at, the, uh, starting at the top, really. So one of the real big subjects that, uh, that basically everyone is talking about at the moment is, of course, care home visitation. Um, and I was really happy to see that you recently put on a live debate to discuss exactly this particular uh, issue. So um, just getting stuck straight into it. Why did you choose to host the debate? Well, I mean, throughout the, the pandemic and throughout what we've been doing for our families, we've had absolutely, you know, fantastic support and understanding. And we've been very open and honest to our, our different avenues. But I was starting to feel and you could feel it happening in the media. I'd been on Sheila Fogarty's uh, uh, LBC channel discussing it and lots of families were up in arms about not being able to see their loved ones uh, and it just started to become a very hot topic for us and I wanted to make sure that the decisions that we were making were fair and, and all heard by all voices so what I decided to do was try and pull as many people together on a debate that might have a slightly different view. We came up with the idea on the Friday and I think the debate was on the Wednesday so it was a bit of a kind of who can I get on board? Uh, Martin obviously very kindly agreed. Uh, and once I knew when he was free, we tried to work those dates around there. I wanted to have a bit of a press uh, presence. So Paul Brand from ITN kindly agreed because he's followed a lot of stories within the care sector uh, over the few months. And Julia Jones um, from the Johns Foundation has been very vocal about really pushing to providers to open their doors. Uh, and also Judy from the um, Carers Association. So she, um, uh, and then we chose a family member and I purposely chose somebody who was really wanting us to open the doors so that we could just sit and discuss in an open way about how we can perhaps look at things differently. We do have our visitors pods as uh, they've been fantastically received, but I know some, some families feel that they feel like a bit like a prison cell because there's a glass partition between them and people with dementia don't understand. So, so yes, yeah, so we pulled it together and it, it happened on the Wednesday afternoon at three, three o'clock. I think we only had Paul Brand for the first sort of half hour uh, and things started to get a little bit more heated uh, about, about an hour in. But yeah, it was good. It, it was good. I had to stay quite calm in a couple of instances because I think a lot of what you're hearing from families who are desperate to open the doors, they're quite isolated you know, issues. And um, yeah. <laughs> I had to stay quite calm at one point, but it was good. It was good. That's what debates are for, aren't they? And I think everyone just listening to each other and trying to find, there's no, there wasn't going to be a solution off the back of one debate, but I think it got the ball rolling. Yeah. What I really like about the, 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 uh, the, the debate is not just the, the subject matter itself, is the fact that you very intentionally engineered it so that it was a debate. I, part of the reason why I, I love doing this podcast is because it creates an environment for effective discourse, for people to have real conversations uh, and for, for people to be able to unpack the subject matter. And I think it's really important when people are having discussions about things that are, if they're particularly uh, emotive subjects, if they're particularly difficult subjects, um, it's really, really key to be able to have, if you're having a debate, to be able to have a debate with people who have really, really differing opinions and almost so that you can learn from each other so that you can appreciate each other's perspective. And what I really like about what you've done is you've engineered it in a way where there's the completely opposing uh, argument uh, to that of yours and maybe other people in the room. But by creating that environment, you've all been had an opportunity to be able to air your opinions, ask each other questions, to be able to really get it out, all out on the, on the table. And, are you necessarily going to get any level of agreement off the back of that? No, you're probably not going to. If people are kind of vehemently stuck in their, 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 their mindset, whichever way that might look. Um, but if people can help understand each other and have a more, um, have, have greater empathy and understanding of the, the other person's perspective, view, position, whatever it might be, I think that's really, really powerful. So really good on you for, for, for opening, uh, opening the, uh, the discussion up and doing it in such a kind of public, public forum. Uh, I can imagine you probably had some butterflies before the discussion because it, as, as you said, it sounded like it got quite, quite heated. Um, well, but 
Yeah, it, it did. And uh, Bryony, bless her, uh, we just threw it on her because I, I thought, well, I can't host it and answer the question. So Bryony uh, got thrown at her last minute to do it. So the pair of us were a little nervous, I think because it was just so last minute and we didn't know how it was going to go. And, I, I, you know, I was really pleased with it. I, when you look back at things, you always think, oh, we should have said this or kind of said a little bit more about that. But like you say, it, it started a discussion. It got got us all talking and I know Julia and Judy have since emailed me uh, and Martin and, and Paul and said you know how well it it went and they were really pleased to be involved and I think if nothing else it's got me talking to to other people that I didn't think I was going to talk to about these subjects so yeah no it's it's opened a lot of avenues and and if we don't have empathy for each other you're right it, we're not going to get through this together we've all got to accept each other's views and try and make the best of what we've got and, and how we handle it. But I think one of the subjects that I wish I'd gone back and, and discussed a little bit more was, was about what our staff have done through all of this. Because yes, I know it is really tough for families to not see their loved ones. And we have created different ways for that to happen, albeit not ideal. Um, at least it's some face-to-face -face contacts. But what the staff have had to sacrifice and, and how hard they work and how dedicated they've been to look after these people that the families you know love so much they have gone above and beyond and i think they that's what i'm very passionate about about making sure that they feel respected and recognized for all of that and and not families kind of you know being angry at them because it's not their fault it's it's how we're having to work through this to keep everybody safe so there was a little bit of that in the debate and, and um, I think my staff were a little upset that <clears throat> they felt that way but you know our staff have gone and I know I know providers across the UK staff have gone above and beyond so I think that's what I, I, I wish I'd said at the time. Isn't, it's a shame isn't it that there's almost like a missed um, a miss uh, focused blame if you uh, if you like it's not the staff's fault it's a it, it's it, it doesn't come down to, to the workforce at the end of the day where uh, the, the social care world has been presented with all sorts of um, really unanswerable questions uh, and there's so much nuance and there's so many different sets of circumstances where people have had to make countless countless um, difficult decisions that you're never going to be able to keep everyone everyone happy but when you're not able to keep people happy and it's such an emotive set of circumstances and everyone stressed, stressed and anxious because of everything else that's going on in the world, it almost, it, 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 it perpetuates that. And I think it's really important to kind of underline the, 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 the fact that the, 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 the social care workforce has been incredibly de uh, dedicated throughout all of the, 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 the whole of the, uh, the, uh, the COVID outbreak. Um, and I know I, I mention it all the time because, well, I, I see it's kind of part of my job to do kind of cheer, cheerleading and things like that. But we do have to recognise and appreciate the the the, uh, the level of commitment and determination that that, that the people have been, um, that the people working in social care have 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 committed to looking after our vulnerable people in the most uh, tumultuous, difficult, challenging, and confusing much of the time um, set of circumstances that anyone can really. <laughs> even envisage ever happening i know and it's uh, just the very next day we had three councils write to us saying you must close your doors of course our doors weren't open because we had these pods and then we had one council that said we couldn't use the pods uh, funny enough they've come out to public health have come out to look at one today and i think uh, we'll be allowed to use them after they've actually physically seen what they are and how they work but yeah, it was it was a bit ironic after the debate, thinking, right, we've all been listening to each other. Let's try and see how we can look forwards from this. And then told to to lock down the very next day. And by the end of that week, it was it was all four northeast councils that uh, had insisted on that in the end. And one of them in particular being quite difficult. But that's one of the things that I keep on thinking about that I I feel quite frustrated about. And I really, I mean, it's probably above my pay grade to even work out how to how to address that particular thing but one of the things that so you've gone to the effort of looking for almost disconfirming evidence against your case of the reasons why you want to uh, the way that you've dealt with um, care home visitation um, because you want to be able to create that environment where you can understand appreciate and have empathy for other people's views and, and that's and that's I think really 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 valuable the 
it seems like the local authorities are almost operating from the completely different end of the end of the spectrum because I I don't feel like there's an awful lot of consultation actually happening with with care providers. It seems there are, there are lots of decisions that are being made from up on high, and I really would challenge some of the rationale and some of the uh, some of the logic behind making some of the some of the decisions because they're just a lot of the time I just don't feel like that that it's actually grounded in truth and science and the reality of the set of circumstances. And there's a lot of I mentioned earlier, but there's a lot of, there's there's a lot of nuance and there's a lot of regionalisation um, that, that 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 comes with that, but. It, it just adds to the complexity of the set of circumstances, these kind of broad stroke ideas of, oh, well, if you just do this, everything's going to be fine. And it's like, well, huh, not sure it will be. And are you going to cause even more problems in the process of making those those types of decisions? Mm, mm. There, there's still a lot of confusion. And you can see from, from some of the group chats I'm on when the, the guidance has come out and they're re-evaluated again. Um, there's a lot of questions still that still lie in between those guidelines. So I think... Uh, yeah, there's still still a lot to be uh, clarified, uh, and we've all, I think, as individual providers, found our own way of dealing with things um, that necessarily that the guidance hasn't given us. So, you know, we've um, had to think on our feet and and move forward. So, like I said about one of those pods, I had an email the next day from a councillor who said um, we need to, we had to ban all use of our visitors pods in that borough, and I just said, have you actually? taking the time to see what it is that we're trying to provide here you know we're talking about mental health and well-being of our families and our uh, and our residents we've we've gone above and beyond to create this environment i think it's ticks the box better than ppe and still still refused but uh, hopefully as of today we've, we've turned that around but i think it's just about like you say uh, communication uh, and for authorities to actually listen to us and not just try and dictate uh, without any kind of proper understanding so we just have to keep fighting and keep trying our best to keep those relationships as as, as best we can and um, and and talk regularly and, and, and understand i mean cqc is starting to finally communicate a little bit more with us so hopefully we can start working a lot closer with them because obviously there was a good period of time where we heard very little so it's uh, we've you know we've got to get that ball rolling again and and see how that goes but we've also got the fear about the testing um and cqc inspectors not being on that list of of, of staff that are going to get the regular tests so how do you then look at that it's uh that really baffles me i've got to say um i whatever happens that's something that whether they u-turn on that one uh, and i really hope they do um uh that's that's something that I, I will never quite manage to get my get my head around with all of the uh, you must do this you must do that you must all of the things that are to, to using your using your words kind of dictated to the social care sector mm. it just seems absolutely baffling that people who need to spend a decent amount of time in a home with, often in a group of people over a handful of days if those people aren't being tested it's like well why and how how is it uh, how how is it safe for for them to do that and for not for for, for family members to do it for uh, other people that need uh, or, or would usually be in a in a, in a care setting um yeah very very confusing it, yeah it doesn't really strengthen the argument for for not allowing families in does it so you know it telling us to lock down but but they can come in so yeah i i do think and i know martin's been tackling that point so hopefully we'll have a little bit more clarity with with that soon one would uh, one would hope so. You mentioned that you've had some more communication with the CQC. What what have you heard so far? And uh, you seem quite positive about the the fact that you'd had some interactions with them. Can you can you help us understand a little bit more about what that's been like? Well, you know, I think we were all very frustrated that right at the beginning CQC were endorsing documents that clearly uh, didn't understand the care home setting and especially people with dementia. So, I think we're just all relieved that we're trying to work together as we used to work before and cqc have they've not been any in any of our homes as of yet thankfully if they're not getting tested i wouldn't want them to be but we're starting to fight you know they're picking up the phone they're offering some support they're they're trying to uh, help some of the managers uh, look at things and and start looking at the paperwork side of things again and how how they're going to support us moving forwards and sending a little bit more guidance and speaking to my operations director as well. So there's 
there's there's a, a little communication, but it's a start. And I think we've got to start finding ways where we can start functioning like we used to, but in different ways to try and you know make sure that we're all doing what we're supposed to be doing and and providing the best care that we can. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, I you, you'd like to like to hope that the obviously the 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 position of the regulator should be to um, to, to to want for providers to to, to be um, compliant. I mean, I know that isn't really the goal. The goal is to make sure you're doing a really good job of people uh, and compliance should 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 follow uh, rather than the uh, rather than the other way around. Um, but you'd like to think after, uh, well, firstly, after quite a lot of radio silence from the CQC, I uh, do wonder what was going on in the meantime, but that's uh, uh, not a question that I'm in a position to be able to answer. Um, but one would hope that they've had an opportunity to uh, to be able to step back and think to themselves, okay, so how can we, how can we, in a different way to, in, in which we would have done in the past, how can we support providers? How can we make sure that they they are in a position where they've got all the tools and the uh, the, the, the capability, etc., to be able to uh, make sure they're coming out the other side of this in the best place best place possible? Because it has been hard. I'm sure, even with the best will in the world, certain things will have. Uh, fallen by the wayside in certain sets of uh, sets, sets of circumstances but this is for me certainly this isn't kind of about pointing blame and about kind of um, trying to uh, uh, trying to um, trying to be negative about the situation let's try and be objective about where we are today and let's try and do the best job of getting it to the best place that it can be in the future yeah like you say there's no point looking back now i think we've got to look forwards we've got to pull together uh, we've all got to use all of our knowledge that we've got cqc included in all of that and try and you know put, keep the care sector going in the right direction and make sure that you know we're all moving forwards because this isn't going to go away and we we know at the minute with the second wave especially up here in the northeast that uh, we're going to be living with this for a long time so we've got to adapt and find new solutions as we move forwards mm. Definitely, definitely, without a shadow of a doubt. So, um, so j just moving backwards quickly, are there any plans to host any other debates in the future that people should be keeping an eye out for? Uh, not at the minute, although you know everything that we seem to to be addressing is all uh, can be quite last minute. So, watch this space. Uh, last one was only done in three days. So, I'm, I, I have potentially talked about doing a follow-up on visiting in the next coming weeks to see where we're at but i think each week we don't know what areas are going to be going into various different lockdowns but there are so many topics i think uh, that we need to to all think about and it would be nice to hold a few more debates more regularly so it means that we're all communicating better and, and better understanding one thing prior to the debate that we were getting a lot of questions about is why can't you get these 20 minute tests why aren't you you know why can't we be tested like the staff can be tested and and that was an opportunity to to let people know that we don't have these 20 minute tests available um and the tests that we do have our have available are taking five days for the results to come back which you know you can't manage it like that because you're yeah. only as good as the day that you have the test so last week for instance we got our tests on the monday um and we still had results from the, the Monday before. Sure. Yeah. I think that's so, one of the big, you know, big things at the moment, isn't it? Yeah. So there's lot I think there's lots of topics. I I think what's quite nice about it is is it's not pointing the finger of blame. It's all trying to have it like you said earlier about having a bit of empathy towards each other and trying to understand everybody's different viewpoints because there are so many emotions flying around at the minute from all sorts of uh, sectors anyway. Uh, and I think it's nice to know that. You know we're listening and we're trying and we, we've got to try and work together i think that's one of the really big big key things uh there if we're going to be collaborative if we're going to be constructive where there are differing opinions i think if people do have an appreciation and an understanding of other people's perspectives or set of circumstances and things you can mm. still be frustrated about the situation but you can be frustrated at uh, about it whilst being in a position of understanding where you actually know objectively what the, the the truth is and i think one of the one of the big problems at the moment and why i i, I get that people want to be able to have access to, to to care homes i really really do i can own well i've had families in uh, uh family members in care environments and i can put myself back in that kind of uh mindset and think to myself mm. what i'd be feeling at the at the time of course 
if that's coming from a from the perspective of being uninformed around the realities of what's actually going on from a testing perspective from a cqc perspective from a local authority perspective from every other covid related perspective that you could think mm. of then the it almost it makes it worse because you're just angry at the situation rather than anything else which is probably um you're never going to be able to be be, be constructive in, if you're in that type of a that type no. of mindset. so um just a quick one just before we move on is it the i understand that the uh, the 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 debate itself was hosted live is there a recording of the debate itself that maybe i could add to the show notes yes absolutely i'll send you the link it's uh, it's on the original link that we did on the url from our website so okay. it's slash the debate but i'll send i'll send you the link and then you can add it on the end of the broadcast week super yeah i'll make sure it's on the on the show notes anyone uh, anyone that's listening to this episode i'm sure will want to go back and listen to the uh, listen to the debate so uh, so yeah thank you very much for that um, that's all right. so one of the uh, one of the things that we like last spoke about when we were when we were recording our last podcast was uh the launch of the care, care badge so for anyone that uh there we go yeah um that for anyone that uh, that, that isn't aware of the uh, of the care badge can you give me a little bit of background around the actual badge itself and also of course what it represents yes so uh right in the thick of it uh when me and my team were just seven days a week 20 hour days it felt like we just were trying everything that we possibly could to support the teams and our staff but obviously everybody was reacting quite differently and there was a lot of panic and a lot of concern uh, and a lot of um out there in the media a, a lot of support that we weren't getting from the government and recognition for what the care sector and our staff were doing so uh, i sat there with one of our lead designers mikey carr who i mentioned to you before and we were just talking about what we could do we, just, we were doing a mental health week right at the very beginning sometime in march um, and we wanted to send out some nice things for the staff and we thought it'd be quite nice to create a badge and then we looked into obviously the care badge and how that had been promised to be sent out and was you weren't able to get your hands on it and then we wanted to sort of produce more of a symbol about what we were all going through there and now so we had the spots uh, the rainbow and the stripes the spots being each and every one of us in the sector and, and the communities the rainbow as you know was a symbol of hope uh, for the nhs so we just used the blue and and, and the um red for the male and female um staff members uh, and then the the lines were the road out of here and hopefully back to some sort of normality we made that available to providers at cost so we really really wanted providers to show their staff how much they appreciate them and care and, and use that badge as a bit of a symbol around that and lots of different providers have done different things uh, with the badge and how they've promoted it and um, how, how they've um, given that to their staff and then we've had a fantastic um, following from the general public as well so it was all again done within about nine days I think from concept to website to uh, you know getting all you know creating websites isn't the easiest thing to do let alone one that you've got to purchase through and all the rest of it um, and then we had a great little press following as well so yeah no it's it's been great I think it's just you know as time moves on I got quite uh, involved in other things so trying to keep the momentum up uh, was, was was difficult but now it's it, we're giving it another push now and we're really really keen to get more and more providers on board uh, and keep that going because it's like i said before this is not going away and i think that all of our staff really need to feel the recognition and, and the support and the respect Mm. I know that uh, there are some really big names that have got behind the uh, the weekend. Yes. Badge. What's the uh, what's the uptake of the uh, the badge been like? It's been fantastic, actually, and we had a massive flurry uh, in the first sort of two or three months. It's died down a little bit, but uh, I think we're going to give it another push and try and get a few more celebrities involved, uh, which was a challenge in itself because right at that time services were being pulled all over the place to support different things weren't they so um it was great and then it went on the uh, goggle box uh, and we had quite a few people from different soaps supporting it so yeah i think uh, i think the support has been been brilliant i'm i'm really really pleased with it 
No, it's been uh, it's been fantastic to to see the Raj popping up in various different uh, different places. So I've uh, I really enjoyed seeing that happen. Uh, and uh, hopefully, if you're going to give it another push, then uh, then I'll end up seeing it in various other places and things in the future, which will be great. So, um, yeah. Why do you see the badge as being so important, especially now? Well, I think I read in, uh, read in the news over the weekend about Mr Hancock promising the care badge out to all the staff and that still hasn't happened. And I think it's important that, you know, if the government's not prepared to recognise them and, and do something of, of some sort of symbolic value, then the fact that we've got this badge and the fact that it's available for providers is, is a fantastic way of, of showing the staff, uh, you know, a, a simple recognition. But we've got to keep pushing the government on recognizing the care sector because I still feel that staff feel very unforgotten and uh, the forgotten sector if you like so as much as we've worked hard to try and push that and you hear lots of different reports on Friday you had the whole news about um, them sending out letters from I think it was Middlesbrough Council wasn't it asking care homes to take in positive cases and then you've got the news today saying no that's absolutely not the case so I think various different initiatives and campaigns that kind of really keep the positivity uh, about what we're doing as a sector and about what the staff are doing needs to needs to keep going. Yeah definitely and I think that's probably one of the um, uh, the importance of the the, the part of the uh, part of the badge itself is to, uh, to to continue that level of recognition just to keep people focused on the fact mm -hmm. that this is a difficult set of circumstances and to try and unite people so i think it's great i'm uh, i'm a big uh, i'm a big fan so i've uh, i shall uh, i shall uh, uh, be keeping an eye out to see where it pops up in the uh, in the future um so uh, so what are the big challenges that you're facing today and um, uh, how do the, the, the challenges that you're facing today um, and, and that you're facing in the future, how does that make you feel? Well, I sort of feel like it's two step forwards, one step back. And I think last week in particular, uh, I was talking to my ops director and we just felt like we jumped back three months with uh, all the different challenges that we were facing again with this new lockdown. But it's difficult to say. I mean, I, f I feel like we're more prepared mentally for another wave. Um, but again, having managed to keep it out of 10 of our homes, you don't know how each individual home is going to react. And it's how you support that. Um, I'm hope to God that we manage to keep it out as we move forwards. But you, you just don't know, do you? And the biggest challenge around that is the testing. And I know we've talked about it to death but it is absolutely key. If you don't get a test soon enough and you don't get the results soon enough, it's almost impossible to trace. So for instance, we were told to try and encourage staff to have their test done at the weekend because it was quieter and they, they promised that they would get the results sooner. So I tested that theory and had a test on the Sunday. I didn't get the results till Thursday. So that could be somebody on shift, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, get the results on Thursday, we should have been isolating long before the result came back on the Thursday. So, you know, it, I'm hoping now, uh, and I have been informed that tests are coming back faster in the homes, but I'll, I'll wait and see where, where we are in a couple of weeks. That's the biggest challenge because you can't see where it is. And if people aren't showing symptoms, how can you manage that? Uh, and the other challenges are all the little logistical sides of, you know, kids going back to school, people understanding what they're supposed to do if they show symptoms or if they've been around somebody and you know it's a general panic does everybody then have to go into isolation for 14 days there's lots of different you know variations so if if for instance someone's tested positive on the monday but they haven't started showing symptoms till thursday friday then they've got to start the re-isolation period from the moment they start showing the symptoms so it's just about making sure everybody understands what it is they're supposed to be doing that we're all being as diligent as possible about trying to keep it out of the homes uh, and 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 follow the rules which are you know the, the the rule of six and now up here obviously the the regional lockdowns uh, and keep going uh, uh, and keep healthy and keep keep looking after each other and listening to each other and and mental health 
is so important and I know we've talked about different ways in the past how we can support that but I think it's it's only going to get worse and we're going to have to really really you know look after the people care mm -hmm. for each other yeah definitely I think that's the uh, I've, I've said this probably a million times on the podcast now but the the for me there's going to be three big uh, costs of the uh, of the pandemic and that's the the human cost the economic cost, and the mental health cost and I think uh, they're all um, very very worrying but I think I probably worry most about the the, the mental health cost in uh, mm. the uh, eventuality of time because people will there will be people that will be scarred by their their experience of of covid the uh the, the, whether it be residents whether it be uh team members whomever it may be family members um we're, we're all suffering at the moment because of the um uh, because of the covid tech circumstances on some level some more than most uh, and the people that are suffering the the most are often the people on the front line who are working their behinds off to to try and mm. Uh, to try and look after their, uh, the, the, the vulnerable people in our society. Um, and then there's the people obviously in the homes as well that, that, that are suffering. So it's, uh, it, it's great to hear that obviously that's kind of up there on the, on the list of priorities, just being conscious of other people and be kind. That's the most important thing that I think people can keep, people can do at this, uh, at this point with all the stress and the anxiety of the set of circumstances. I think that's, um, Hopefully, well, one of my one of my hopes off the back of COVID is that that maybe we're all a little bit wiser and a little bit kinder. Anyway, um, absolutely, so, yeah. Um, that we can that we can both hope for. So, um, one one thing that I thought would be uh, I'd be interested to hear your, your your view on. So, you mentioned your conversations with your uh, operations director. How, mm. how are you and your team preparing for the for the second wave? Well, we, we're just making sure that the teams, like I said before, are fully informed of what they need to continue doing. We've started looking at um, other ways in, in how we can better communicate between the 14 homes that we have and share, share principles and ideas. Uh, we are just doing what we've been doing all the way through, really. Be very, very diligent, very, very supportive. Um, every home, like I say, ha has reacted differently to this. So it's just about having empathy from all sorts of different viewpoints and how we can support that. Um, trying to work closer with people like the CQC, now getting those relationships back up and running. Having a little bit of normality amongst the crazy times that we face uh, and trying to sort of, you know, make sure that, like you say, we're, we're looking after the mental health uh, of the residents, the families and the staff. Uh, and looking at different initiatives of, of how we can do that because we've got Christmas coming, you know, Halloween, Halloween and all those different events where we'd normally be doing so much with the community and the families. How can we look at different ways of creating those relationships, keeping those relationships going uh, and different inventive ways of, of, you know, having those celebrations without it obviously impacting on visiting and, and all the rest of it so there's a lot of uh discussion about christmas at the minute and i think families are getting very concerned that we might still be in lockdown at that point so we've looked at some virtual reality uh, ideas uh we've got um a 360 degree camera and i was thinking the other day wouldn't it be nice to see if we can lend that camera out to some families and make those recordings either be it a virtual reality we've got the headsets or just on a screen so we can share some really key events that are important to each of the families and, and the relatives that we have in our homes that's a, a, another area that we're thinking about so i love the vr idea there's been uh, mm. a lot of topic around uh, it's been a hot topic conversation um within the sector for uh, for a while and i think that's mm. uh, I think that's a beautiful application so um, I'm conscious of time, so we'll uh, we'll wrap it up for there today. But maybe we we'll uh, we'll reconnect on a, on another podcast in the not too distant future. But uh, Rachel Beckett, a pleasure to have you back on the Care Home Show. Uh, and thank, thank you for having me today. Thank you.